So good afternoon. Thank you everyone uh, for being here and thanks for the, the organizers for this very nice symposium on quantum sensing uh, with hot atomic vapors. My name is Kostas Mouloudakis. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at ICFO in Barcelona and today I will be talking about recent, recent progress on an optically pumped magnetometer uh, using miniaturized and mass producible components. And part of the talk that I will be discussing today is among the outcomes of the work package team of the Maximal project, partners of which are ICFO in Barcelona, CSEM uh, here in Neuchâtel, Switzerland, Megin, VTT and uh, Alto University, which are based uh, in Finland. Uh, now, uh, one of the most prominent applications of uh, uh, optical pump magnetometers is magnetocephalography where MBG is a non-invasive brain imaging technique for studying the brain activity with high temporal and spatial resolution. And uh, usually uh, the brain produces signals which are of the order of a few tens of femtotesla, and they have a, a, field component, a strong field component which is transverse to the scalp. Of, uh, of, to the scalp. And uh, the signals usually oscillate at the frequency range between DC and uh, 150 hertz. And uh, currently there are two powerful techniques for measuring uh, these magnetic signals. One which is traditionally used in clinical applications is uh, using squids, superconducting quantum interfer interference devices, which is the one we see on the left. And uh, they usually require cryogenic cooling. This is large devices. And uh, the second technique is using optically pumped magnetometers, uh, where they op operate optimally in a zero background field. So we have to put the human subject in a magnetically shielded room. And uh, usually there are SIM coils attached to the walls of the magnetic shielded room uh, that uh, they cancel the magnetic field globally at the position uh, of, the, of the head. Now, although uh, OPMs are still OPMMG is still uh, limited at uh, research uh, applications. It's a promising candidate for replacing squids, uh, be mostly because they don't require uh, cryogenic cooling and uh, because they can be uh, arranged in flexible helmets like the one we see in this picture. Now, recent years have witnessed a lot of, a lot of progress towards miniaturization uh, of optically pumped sensors. And there are many, many examples of uh, optically pumped sensors. And out of this progress of miniaturization, there are also very interesting uh, uh, companies that have emerged, like Twinleaf and, and Qspin. And clearly, the miniaturization aspects uh, have been demonstrated successfully. And uh, there are also companies uh, that try to push MG, OPM MG further, where they design clever sensor arrays uh, and that can be integrated in helmets like the one we see in this picture on the right, which is uh, currently the state of the art uh, of the field. Now, using optical pump magnetometers in MEG requires the sensor to, to have some characteristics, to satisfy some characteristics simultaneously. So the sensor has to be sensitive, to be fast, fast enough to capture the fastest uh, brain signals, to have a large dynamic range, to be close packable, manufacturable in mass, and with that we mean thousands per unit or even millions per unit, and at the same time to be cost effective and reliable with high repeatability when produced in large numbers. And uh, although all these characteristics or these requirements have been demonstrated separately in laboratory, in research laboratory activities. Currently, uh, the commercially available sensors fail to satisfy all of this simultaneously. And uh, actually, in this talk, uh, I will talk about our efforts and our approach in uh, developing a sensor out of components that, uh, when produced in mass, can be quite inexpensive and uh, have similar or even better sensitivity or properties compared to the commercially available sensors. Uh, 
So now we move on to the next part of the talk, which is the physics and the desirable, uh, desirable characteristics that we want from a sensor. Uh, our sensor is based on the zero field de resonance technique, uh, which has been commonly used in miniaturized magnetometers, exactly because it just requires a laser beam, some optics to configure the, the laser beam, and uh, a vapor cell and a photodetector. And uh, uh, so the main idea of the technique is th that the magnetic signal, the magnetic readout is based on the absorption signal. And as we can see in this curve, at zero magnetic field, we get a very light transmission out of the vapor cell, whereas uh, as the magnetic field increases, the transmission goes down to zero. And in this video, you could see a live demonstration uh, of, th of this, this technique, but unfortunately, we cannot play it. Um, so one very important figure of merit for characterizing the performance of uh, the sensor is what we call sharpness, which is defined as the amplitude uh, of uh, the zero field resonance di divided by the width. And the amplitude is related to the signal of the sensor, whereas the width is, div is related uh, to the coherence time. And, uh, both of these can be simultaneously optimized uh, regarding the number density of rubidium, or in other words, the, the temperature. And uh, this is demonstrated in these two plots. And uh, if we see, for example, the second plot, we can see that the width, which is represented by these red dots, uh, has a constant plateau, and then it starts uh, dropping as we increase the temperature, because uh, in this way, uh, we suppress, since we are working very close to zero magnetic field. Uh, we suppress the spin exchange relaxation. We are entering the surface regime. And at the same time, looking at the blue dots, uh, the sharpness increases because we increase the number density of atoms until uh, we reach an optimal point uh, regarding the temperature. Now, uh, we can further shrink down the zero field resonance width by using uh, buffer gas atoms in the vapor cell. So we use nitrogen. And if we look on the second plot, the sharpness as a function of uh, buffer gas pressure, we see that there is an optimum around between three and four bars. And uh, this can be understood if you look the relaxation rate where, uh, as a function of the buffer gas pressure, where we can see that at low pressures, wall collisions dominate. And then, as we increase the pressure, wall collisions go down. And at some point, spin destruction collisions between nitrogen and rubidium start to increase. And we have an optimal point, which is between three and four uh, bars. So uh, our sensor operates optimally in uh, that pressure. Now, it's commonly used uh, to, de to detect the magnetic signal using lock-in detection, where we modulate the transverse magnetic field and demodulate the, transmi the transmission signal. And this has two main advantages. One is that we get an out-of-phase component after the modulation, which is linear in the magnetic field. And uh, the other advantage is that we can suppress the low frequency noise, the 1 over F noise, uh, by moving to another reference frame. Uh, now, we have uh, discussed about the physics and the desired characteristics, and we move on to the technology and the characterization of the various components. Uh, one of the most important ingredients of our sensor is the vapor cell. We are using vapor cells that are designed uh, by CSEM, uh, MEM cells, uh, which are uh, produced in this silicon wafer. And uh, we are using the dual chamber technology uh, based on the rubidium azide decomposition. So rubidium azide is placed in the reservoir chamber, and then it is decomposed into rubidium and nitrogen vapors. Uh, uh, where they pass, uh, they are distilled in the science cell uh, through some microchannels which connect the two chambers together. Uh, using this technique, uh, we have managed to achieve record uh, buffer gas pressures uh, of the order of three and uh, between three and four bars at room temperature, which was the required values. And, uh, 
and of these cells can produce with uh, high repeatability. And um, of course, we can characterize these cells by using uh, absorption spectroscopy by the width and, uh, and the absorption sigma. Another important ingredient of our sensor is the miniature biplanar coils, where we use coils that are integrated uh, on the sensor. And uh, alongside with the vexel lasers and the MEM cells, uh, we recently demonstrated in this paper, uh, that you can see below the first picture, that uh, these coils can be manufactured in mass in a cost-effective way and have very good properties. And uh, this paper was accepted recently in Physical Review Applied. Uh, and coming now to the characteristics of uh, uh, these sensors, uh, these coils, excuse me, uh, we have two requirements that they need to satisfy regarding the physics. Uh, one is to have uh, a uniform magnetic field as, as uniform as possible at the, at the position between uh, the two planes of the coils. And the other requirement is to have minimal stray magnetic fields around the sensor. Uh, regarding the design uh, characteristics, we want the cell to be placed as close as possible to the edge uh, of the coils, to be as close as possible to the scalp surface. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we use the biplanar technique where we can produce three-dimensional three magnetic fields uh, by just using two PCB planes uh, along one single direction. Um, now, the magnetic fields are produced by current loops, which are embedded in the PCB, uh, the PCB planes. We use multi-layer PCBs. And uh, this has been, has been designed using the B-field tools uh, software and the stream function method, where we can find a lot of details in these two, uh, in these two publications on the left corner of the screen. Now, in order to characterize the stray field performance uh, of our coils and to validate uh, our results and, uh, regarding the software simulations, we perform stray field measurements. We place uh, the coils in a magnetic shield, in a magnetic shield sorry, and uh, we, use, we, we place a Q-spin sensor at a distance of 20 millimeters uh, from the coils, and we translate point by point and rotate sim simultaneously the coils. And in this way, we can produce these uh, 2D plots, which on the y-axis, they have uh, the rotation, and on the x-axis, the distance. And we compare the computed values against the experimental, and we find, find very good uh, agreement between, uh, between experimental and simulated results. Uh, this validates uh, our stray, the stray field performance of the coils. Uh, regarding the field homogeneity, we have performed uh, free induction decay measurements. We use a DBR laser, which is fiber coupled and has a power of uh, 5 milliwatts. It's elliptically polarized. Part of the beam is used to polarize the atoms and part of the beam to probe uh, using Faraday rotation and we modulate uh, the laser intensity uh, in synchronously with the alarm of frequency. And then we stop the modulation, we apply a large magnetic field, and we obtain these FID signals. Then we, uh, we take the Fourier transform, and we can see this light, nice Lorentzian uh, spectra where we can fit them. And from the fit, we can extract the central frequency and the width. And uh, by plotting the width as a function of the central frequency, the larval frequency, we can get the inhomogeneity, information about the inhomogeneity, and uh, the field-to-current ratio. And we find very good agreement between uh, the computed and the experimental values. Finally, I would like to shortly say a few things about the sensor integration. So uh, there is a lot of progress towards uh, this direction. Uh, towards integrating our sensor. 
So the, the current strategy that we are using is that we start with a scale-up uh, setup like the one you see on the left where we use oversized coils. And with, with this setup, we know that the coils have a very large homogeneity and uh, we try different components like vexel lasers, uh, MEMS, different ovens. And when we reach a very good sensitivity, then we move on to the next step where we try to miniaturize the sensor, we change uh, one component at a time, and we try to reach same levels of magnetic sensitivity. And if this is achieved, then we are happy. If not, we go a step back and we redesign uh, the components. Uh, and so in this, in this way, our sensor uh, has passed through a lot of phases towards miniaturization. Currently, uh, we have uh, in our lab this uh, sensor that you see on the, on the right, which is of dimensions 2.5 by 2 by 0 0.5. And uh, we have reached a magnetic sensitivity, which is around 15 from the Tesla, uh, uh, which is comparable to the currently available sensors. It's quite promising. And uh, our future plan is to manage to make the sensor as uh, chip scale, as like, like this uh, uh, atomic clock that you can see on this on the left bottom side, which is uh, atomic clock that produced by uh, designed by Maximal team, and we hope in this way to make uh, uh, in the future MEG more uh, more affordable and more accessible to the people, to the clinical centers, and to the uh, research institutes. Uh, with that, I would like to thank. Uh, our uh, ICFO team, uh, the Atomic uh, Quantum Optics Group, and uh, of course our partners that uh, have contributed uh, to the work on the coils that I, I described you, and of course all the partners, CNCM, ICFO, Medin, BTT, and Alto University. Thank you. Many thanks, Costas. I think we have just time for one question, otherwise we'll... Uh overload the program. So the question is, do you use any integrated coils for internal magnetic shield field cancellation? Yes, actually these coils that I saw here, uh, actually this magnetometer in order to operate optimally, it needs to be at exactly zero magnetic field. So we operate the sensor in a magnetic shield, a ferrite magnetic shield. Yeah, the coils have been used uh, for minimizing the, straight, the, the magnetic fields at the position of the MM cell. Thank you very much, Costas. So, Jan uh, Vito is going to tell us about graduometers using uh, multipass vapor cells. Okay, good afternoon. Um, thanks a lot to the organizers for uh, uh, setting up this very nice symposium, and uh, uh, it's very nice to be back uh, uh, to a conference in person. Um, <coughs> And uh, yeah, also uh, thanks for letting me uh, talk about uh, some of my research. Uh, so currently I'm a, a Marie Curie co-found uh, uh, fellow at the Barcelona Institute of Science and Technology, uh, working in the group of uh, uh, Morgan Mitchell at ICFO. And um, yeah, as you know, thanks to this, uh, uh, I'm contributing to the uh, maximal efforts uh, within the quantum flagship. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can also get some new results by the end of the project. However, in these uh, 15 minutes today, uh, I'll talk about uh, uh, some of the outcomes uh, of my postdoctoral research uh, at Princeton University uh, between 2016 and 2019. And uh, um, this is kind of a complementary uh, work. And uh, because of that, uh, I would like to thank with the acknowledgments. So I need to thank uh, um, Professor Mike Romalis uh, uh, for his supervision and uh, uh, Wong Jeli, which is a PhD student that uh, uh, worked closely with me uh, to these projects, and uh, uh, Nezi Dural and Mike Sosa uh, for the vapor uh, cell fabrication uh, by glass blowing technique and anodic bonding techniques, and uh, uh, especially uh, Tom Kornack, Elizabeth Foley, and uh, uh, Mark Limes, which was also postdoc uh, in Mike's group and now is also at Twinleaf, um, that is a, a company. Um, spin-off company on magnetometry and uh, was a key uh, collaborator during my research stay. 
Okay, so this is the outline. Uh, it's good I'm the third speaker, so we already had the, uh, the context of uh, uh, optical magnetometry and some uh, exciting application. And uh, in this talk, uh, I'll focus on the third uh, uh, operating mode, uh, which is based on scalar or total field uh, magnetometers, uh, differently from the other two uh, operating modes of SERF and uh, RF magnetometry. So I'll focus on some advantages of this technique, uh, especially when implemented as a gradiometer and using multi-pass cells. Uh, I'll describe three experiments uh, briefly. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, a, a gradiometer uh, which reaches femtotesla sensitivity uh, up to the earth uh, uh, magnetic field. And the second one is uh, a highlight uh, on the application of this uh, 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 scalar magnetometer, gradiometer, uh, to the detection of uh, uh, MEG and MCG in ambient environment. And uh, um, finally, I like to finish with uh, uh, a direct gradiometer that uses a single multipulse cell where we get intrinsic cancellation of uh, uh, rotation signals. <clears throat> So uh, we already heard uh, uh, from uh, Costa's talk that uh, uh, self magnetometers uh, uh, have several advantages over squids uh, in, uh, uh, for instance, flexibility and miniaturization. And, uh, um, and uh, yeah, still uh, there are some limitations uh, of uh, uh, self OPMs. Uh, one of them is a limited dynamic range due to the operating mode where we use this uh, uh, quadrature uh, uh, signal, and so there is a limited linear linearity uh, inherently with the, with, the, with the system, and uh, to data acquisition where we use uh, uh, voltage measurements. And uh, um, the second uh, main limitation is uh, uh, the operation near zero field, uh, so both squids and serfs, uh, physics uh, work for a very controlled and uh, uh, magnetic field below one nanotesla. And so since the first demonstration of magnetoencephalography by David Cohen in the early 70s, uh, expensive and uh, complex uh, shielded rooms are used for these uh, um, applications. And still today, 50 years later, we still uh, need to deal with expensive shielded rooms or complex uh, 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 zeroing uh, uh, coils or nulling coil system, in this case uh, uh, with active shielding. So uh, I'll describe this a class of uh, uh, magnetometers that can extend the, the dynamic range of uh, uh, the self uh, OPMs to much uh, higher uh, uh, and uh, stronger magnetic fields. And in particular, uh, in the gradiometer operation, the noise level of, the, uh, of a single channel, of a single magnetometer channel, can be, can, is brought back to a noise level which is good enough to detect biomagnetism in a shielded environment. So, uh, of course, uh, in this way we could uh, get rid of uh, uh, the major sources of cost in, for these applications, we are, which are the uh, cryogenic cooling and the cryostat for squids and magnetic shielding uh, for self OPMs. So this can uh, uh, really open a new horizon of, uh, of applications. For instance, I can think about uh, uh, applications of OPMs in remote areas where there is no... Uh, um, where it is not possible to have these uh, expensive, expensive uh, shielded rooms, or uh, uh, more in the long term to brain machine interfaces, magnetic navigation, and also um, applications of OPMs in a shielded environment like uh, geophysical uh, prospecting. And so uh, the major challenge of my research at Princeton for these three years was the detection, uh, being able to detect the biomagnetism in an unshielded uh, environment. In order to uh, address and solve that challenge, uh, we used a number of techniques that uh, I'll introduce now with this first uh, uh, practical implementation of uh, a scalar uh, gradiometer. So as a first experiment, we used this compact, uh, compact sensor uh, uh, made by Twinleaf that included uh, all these uh, um, tools and techniques uh, in the right column. So uh, I'm referring now to the uh, top right picture. Here we included a, a multipass cell uh, made by anodic bonding technology, a Vixel probe, a compact polarization and detection optics, uh, fiberized heaters, and a quadrant photodiode. Then uh, this system was placed into a, a five layers of metal magnetic shielding, and uh, we used a, a pulsed uh, laser, which was separated and uh, uh, was working uh, in, uh, uh, with very uh, high power and uh, um, also was uh, orthogonal to the magnetic field that in this case was applied in the Z direction. 
then uh, um, the probe un uh, undergoes a multipass reflection and paramagnetic Faraday rotation. And this is detected uh, uh, with uh, a dual balance polarimeter. Then in this case, this particular case, the probe beam was made elliptical. And so in this way, we, we could get a gradiometer operating mode uh, with a, a short baseline of 0 0.2 centimeters. And then uh, this is a work that uh, relatively low temperature, uh, between 80 and 100, 100 degrees uh, Celsius. And uh, uh, we use a high bandwidth data acquisition card for frequency measurements. So the multipass feature is only one that was in, in the title of my talk, is just one of the uh, features that are needed uh, to uh, realize what is actually a pulsed uh, scalar radiometer. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is the pump probe sequence. We use this uh, uh, pulse regime uh, with, uh, to generate a, a near unity polarization uh, with pulses of duration of uh, uh, less than a microsecond. And uh, this is kind of a, a bell bloom detection in um, extreme conditions of power and for short pulses. So we use the peak power of about two watts in a microsecond. So now the fully polarized ensemble uh, would precess in the presence of the transverse field, and this precession was probed with an off resonant probe uh, for about five milliseconds uh, with the, uh, a Vixen laser at uh, about the maximum available power, about in this case 400 microwatt. Now these are the typical uh, free induction decay signals because uh, now the, the pump beam is off, so there is no light shift, no noise from the pump and uh, uh, we could fit uh, very well these two signals uh, uh, with the sine wave with exponential decay, and in this way we could get the two Larmor frequencies for the two channels and also an array of frequency differences. And uh, by knowing the repetition rate of the process, which was uh, 180 hertz in this case, uh, we could uh, measure the uh, magnetic noise uh, uh, density, and uh, what we obtained experimentally uh, has been a sensitivity of a differential sensitivity of 14 femtotesla per root hertz um, over a very broad range. So here you see that if we increase the magnetic field from the DC field from 5 to 50 microtesla, which is comparable to uh, Earth's magnetic field, uh, the level of sensitivity did not change. So this is a nice demonstration of the linearity of this kind of uh, frequency measurements. And uh, uh, furthermore, the, the operation was a quantum noise limited. I don't have time here to go into these details, but uh, uh, here we, we showed already uh, that we could satisfy two of the requirements for operation uh, in a shielded environment, which, were, which are uh, uh, very high sensitivity and uh, ultra high dynamic range. Now also, uh, this sensitivity projected to a, a baseline of uh, uh, three centimeter would give something that is compar comparable to, to squid sensitivity, so is what is used in uh, MEG. And then the third requirement for operation in, shield in, the, in the unshielded environment is to have a broadband uh, uh, common noise, uh, common mode noise cancellation. And uh, the way to uh, measure that is uh, to apply, as in this case, a low frequency modulation of a uniform field and to see how the, the signal is cancelled in the gradiometer uh, mode where we uh, subtract the, uh, the, the two channels. And uh, here uh, we obtained a very high common mode rejection ratio, higher than 10 to the 4, when we applied a, an oscillating field in, in both directions, uh, Y and Z in this case. And so uh, this is the third requirement for operation in a shielded environment, uh, where uh, yeah, we need to cancel all the uh, noise sources from the environment, which can occur, uh, of course, at different frequencies. Okay, now uh, once we obtain this uh, and satisfy these three requirements, then uh, uh, the similar system was moved out of the uh, shielding actually in uh, uh, outdoor environments. So now I'm going to describe this uh, uh, highlight. And uh, so here you can see uh, a picture in the field in New Jersey, uh, uh, close to Princeton, uh, where uh, a similar sensor, but in this case with two multipass cells, uh, was uh, uh, used uh, to perform these measurements. And uh, this uh, uh, was a collaboration between uh, Princeton University, uh, Twin Leaf, and SRI International uh, within a DARPA program uh, called uh, Ambient, which was a very ambitious program in the US with different competitors uh, to get this level of sensitivity in uh, ambient uh, environment. 
And uh, uh, so we used two cells, and now you already uh, know these two signals. So these are free induction decay signals with the uh, alarm compression of 360 kilohertz because the main field now is Earth's field. And uh, uh, we use custom frequency counters. Here there was a lot of electronics developed by Twinleaf and SRI International, uh, where basically all the needed electronics was uh, uh, just uh, uh, placed in a compact uh, and portable boxes. And, uh, um, and so here you can see the, the frequency counting already uh, transformed in magnetic field units. And, uh, uh, and the noise level for the single channel uh, shows uh, a noise level between 1 and 10 picotesla per root hertz and some noise peaks, uh, 60 hertz and, uh, um, and uh, uh, it's harmonic uh, and in Europe this will be 50 hertz and then this interesting peak of 25 hertz was from the Amtrak uh, uh, train station close to the place where the measurement was performed so they were able to, to see actually the trains uh, uh, move uh, back and forth. And, uh, but still, in the, uh, when the two measurements are, uh, when the two noise floor are, sub are uh, subtracted, uh, then the gradiometer the noise floor uh, was ab at about 16 femtotesla per centimeter per root hertz. And this was enough uh, to test uh, uh, this sensor uh, for detection of, uh, magneto uh, of signals from the human brain. So as source of uh, uh, signal from the uh, human brain, um, what uh, we used was uh, um, auditory evoked fields that are uh, magnetic fields generated by a human brain as a response to a sound. So uh, we used the randomized audio stimuli delivered by a non-magnetic uh, pneumatic earphone. Uh, and so um, as a response, the, the, the brain uh, would generate a, a current and a magnetic field. And uh, uh, yeah, then we use this gradiometer to uh, measure this signal, and, uh, which is uh, uh, shown in this figure. Of course, in this case, there was, uh, was needed a lot of uh, averaging. This is uh, an average signal of uh, 462 uh, signals. And uh, also, uh, there, were, there was some uh, uh, signal filtering of uh, like a notch uh, filters at these uh, uh, technical noise peaks and also a, a low-pass uh, filter. But this is the first detection of magnetoencephalography in a shielded environment by using uh, uh, OPMs. And then uh, in the same paper, we described uh, uh, the same application to magnetoencephalography, which, uh, of course, gives a uh, uh, better signal-to-noise ratio because the amplitude of, of the signals uh, magnetic signals from the, from the heart are uh, um, two, about two orders of magnitude uh, larger. Okay, I would like to finish with uh, uh, another work where I was primarily involved, uh, which is a direct gradiometer using a single multipath cell. Uh, so in the first experiment, uh, I told you that the sensitivity was a quantum noise limit, so um, what we can do better than that uh, is, of course, to apply some quantum enhancement techniques or to uh, increase the number of passes uh, and so the optical depth uh, uh, in the measurement. Uh, however, uh, uh, by increasing that, uh, the, signals, uh, the signal gets more complicated because we get rotations larger than pi over 4, and there is what we call a wrapping of, uh, of the signal. Furthermore, as in this case, it is interesting to, uh, to implement a technique when, where the two signals are intrinsically cancelled, and so the output signal is just one. And that's what we did here. We used a V-shaped sensor, uh, also uh, done with, anodically, uh, with anodic bonding techniques, and uh, the beam uh, uh, was focused in the first mirror to a hole of 170 microsecond, uh, micro, micrometers, sorry. and then uh, uh, the beam was expanded uh, to the two back mirrors. So these are, uh, were spherical mirrors with 100 millimeter uh, radius of curvature. And so the beam was expanded and reflected back. And then the same probe beam was interacting with two uh, atomic ensembles within the same cell. And uh, uh, it's not shown here, but we used a pump laser in, the, in this case that was a DBR amplified by a TA. And the two regions, the two atomic regions, were uh, uh, pumped with uh, uh, circular polarization with opposite helicity, with sigma plus and sigma minus. And this corresponds to have a phase shift of pi between the two ensembles. And so 
when then we run the, the experiment, uh, on the top you can see the single channel, so you can see this wrapping, and which seems like a non-linearity in the free induction decay signal. Also, there is some physical effect from the uh, partial, relax, partial suppression of, of uh, uh, spin exchange because we have a near fully polarized ensemble. And then in, uh, in uh, blue and red, you see the pi uh, difference between the, the, the signals in the two channels. And, uh, and this is because we were stopping just the pumping in one half of the cell. Now, when we have both uh, ensemble pump, what we get is very nice signal, which is near zero if there is no gradient, and there's an amplitude that uh, depends uh, linearly on the magnetic field gradient uh, for uh, uh, near zero and short, uh, small uh, um, gradients in this case. And so here you can see the calibration of, the, of this intrinsic uh, gradiometer, and then we stay near zero, and from the scatter of this frequency difference, we could uh, uh, get an experimental sensitivity of 10 femtotesla per centimeter per rotors. Okay, with this I finished, um, and uh, uh, so I think I uh, convinced you that uh, uh, scalar magnetometers and gradiometers can be a, a valuable alternative uh, to squids and surf uh, OPMs uh, to perform biomagnetic measurements in unshielded environment. In particular, I, um, that's because we can reach both uh, uh, high sensitivity, ultra high dynamic range, and uh, uh, high common mode rejection ratio. And um, yeah, so in the first experiment, uh, uh, we showed the quantum noise limited operation up to the Earth's magnetic field. And uh, in the second experiment, uh, uh, we showed the first demonstration of, uh, biomagneti of biomagnetism det detection in a shielded environment. And currently, uh, people are doing study, uh, studies of, of this application for uh, uh, localize uh, the sources of mag in, uh, in a shielded environment, for instance, this second reference from the group in Boulder. And finally, I showed you a V-shaped direct gradiometer uh, where we, get, we got an intrinsic cancellation of uh, uh, rotation signals in the high polarization and high density regime. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Gianvito. For the time being, there is no question on the, on the chat, or there is one, but I have another one. Uh, which for the previous talk to Rebecca, there was a, a question about AOM uh, restrictions in terms of bandwidth, and the question was, can you replace the AOM by the EOM? Um, so this is actually one of the ideas we had. Uh, so the AOM, we just use, we use usually these AOMs uh, for our experiments. So these are just the devices we have around. I think we had the same thing before in one of the other talks. And uh, EOMs are pretty expensive, so you have to be pretty sure that this is gonna what you wanna use and that you get the benefit out of it, but this is one of the ideas, how to be able to go to higher um, alarm or frequencies. Thanks. So I'm going to read the question from the chat. read the question from here. Ah. So uh, there's a question from Michael to Gianvito. It sounds, is the measurement direction limited by the direction of the Earth magnetic field? Yeah, so... Uh... So in order to get the maximum signal, in this case, the, uh, basically the sensors were uh, oriented uh, in a, such that the pump and probe were orthogonal with the Earth's field. So in particular, these kind of sensors are just a, uh, one dead zone area, which is along the pump and probe axis. So if, there is a, if the, the field is not exactly orthogonal to the pump and probe, then there is a signal reduction, but still uh, high sensitivity. The unique only dead zone is along the uh, pump and probe direction. Are there other questions? No, no other questions from the audience, some questions? No, so I would like to thank the three speakers for the OPM session.